Let's test it out. So it should be good now. Cool. Okay. How's everybody doing today? So at least, at least here in Toronto, it's finally sunny. So it's Victoria Day weekend. So it's my pleasure to host Dr. Harry Gluckman as well today on CIDN Forum. And Dr. Gluckman originates out of South Africa and he has a full-time private practice in Cape Town, and he's the director of the Implant and Aesthetic Academy. As well, he has a postgraduate training facility providing postgraduate training in implantology and aesthetic dentistry in South Africa. So Howie, it's my pleasure to have you here today and have this nice informal discussion on implant dentistry. Thanks, Mark. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back with you. We had a great time with Maurice and, uh, and Roberto, and um, it's great to be back uh, with the Canadian group. It's always uh, what I love about your group is they're so active and they have, uh, you know, I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's a cool group of people. There's a lot of respect, which is nice in this day and age, because it doesn't happen too often. And uh, a lot of challenging questions from people who know what they're doing. So it's really cool to be part of your network. And uh, again, thank you so much for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. So I had the chance to actually meet you through an online medium, which was Dental XP Forum several years ago. I've met a lot of great friends through this forum. We've gotten to connect in person at meetings in Atlanta and Florida. And when people ask me, how did you learn what you know? Uh, I say it doesn't come ever from one textbook or one course that I've attended. It's the accumulation of my adventures of meeting different people and picking up various tips and tricks from people along the way. And I would say for sure you're one of those mentors who I've had the chance to ask questions personally to and learn those tips and tricks without having to make those mistakes myself. So for sure, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. So I wanted to split our discussion into various categories and beginning with the past of implant dentistry to the present of implant dentistry and future uh, technologies or avenues that implant dentistry is headed into. So I first sure. wanted to start on a case that I remember vividly from when you had posted on the dental XP form several years ago. And I have to give you acknowledgement for posting it because a lot of people don't share their failures and complications. And you see these <laughs> cases that are, uh, that are shared and the case looked fantastic at placement and at year one and at year three or five. And you're brave enough to actually have shared your complication with it, which was the placement of wide diameter implants in the anterior zone. So a lot of uh, the trends right now are varying back from wide diameter implants to using narrower implants. So what's your thought on when to use different sizes of implants, because I think the trend is shifting back to using a narrower diameter implant. Um, I have to say that that case, um, that case um, was a eye opener for me because it taught me a hell of a lot. And I think it's important for us to go back and photograph our complications because um, when we look at, when we look at our cases over time and we see how they develop and we, you know, if we pretend and we bullshit ourselves that everything's perfect and, you know, everything's going well, then, you know, you know, you never learn anything. And uh, we've seen so many cases, you know, with so much Facebook and, and, and webinars and things like that. We've seen so much perfection. And it's always a frustration for me because perfection doesn't tell a story because perfection is just, a, it's almost like DSD. You know, if you do DSD and you take a smile, a smile is just a point in time. And if you take a video, then you see the full Duchenne smile, you see the full extent of the lip lift, the, 
you know, the, you, you can really get a, a bit of visibility. And I think that's the difference. It's the, it's the one-off photo versus the video, whereas the video is the, the lifespan, the, the time, you know, how things have developed over time. And I think um, far too often we get, we, we get shown the exception, not the rule. And uh, it's frustrating, and it's, I think it's very frustrating. I was very frustrated as a youngster, and hence I always, I always show my complications because I think it makes us more real and it makes us more believable. And I think uh, it's one of um, my strengths, certainly as a, as a lecturer, because I'm, I'm not scared to show my failure. I think the failure is, is, is critical. That specific case was, uh, was an eye-opener because we, we started, we were using, I think that was a 5.5 millimeter implant in a, uh, in a central. And obviously in those days, it was the year 2000. And in those days, we placed as wide as possible because we still believed, stupidly enough, that uh, placing an implant was going to maintain the buccal plate. Um, but obviously, we now know that that's not the case. And we know that with bundle bone, it's going to collapse. So certainly there was a lot of move afterwards. You know, the, the, move, the move really came, I think it started around 2009 when uh, Danny Booz and Urs Belsa wrote a, a publication in the supplement of the Jomi, the year of the Jomi, where they, where they basically said that immediate implants should not be done. And I think what happened was, is that um, although I didn't agree with the the concept, but it really was a great thing to happen because it really made us focus our minds as to what was really happening, where everybody was putting up stuff. And funnily enough, we still see it today, people putting up the same stuff we did 15 years ago and claiming success and it works like a bomb and stuff like that. It doesn't, you know what I mean, not long term. But it, it kind of made us focus our minds as to what was going on. And there were really great publications, uh, Ferris, Evans, uh, Caneva, Cavani, I can name so many, Botticelli, I mean, uh, Cadropoli, you know what I mean? There were so many great um, publications that came out post that, where we started to really look at what happened to post extraction. And we realized that the wider we went, the less chance there was of having bone around the implant. So that kind of pushed everything more towards a narrower, narrower diameter, but obviously, why did we have wide implants? We had them for the pure reason that we, we thought that the emergence profile had to start at the implant. Whereas if we, if we, if we look now at Sue, uh, Sue, um, uh, Sue's article, which I think is just such a brilliant article about subcritical and critical contour. And if anyone wants it, I'm happy to share it with you that you can pass it on to them or anybody who, you know, they can email me and I'll happily send them this article. But what it explained was it explained how we need to kind of keep things as narrow as possible. And the emergence profile only needs to start one millimeter below the gum for you to have something look absolutely natural. So bearing that in mind, you know, now we can really go down to narrow implants. We could really bring things as narrow as possible. We could bring them far into the palate, which is Cavani, Caneva, Evans, etc. All those guys that suggested palatal implants, deeper implants, etc. Within the within the within the contour of the crown, though, and that really started us moving in a narrower diameter phase, and and. We are now in that phase, and certainly our mantra, as I said the other night, as narrow as possible, as wide as necessary, and that's our mantra. You want to go as narrow as possible. So the narrowest, if you if you can put a 3.5 millimeter implant in a space, that's the size implant I would like to, to go for. Even if I have 12 millimeters of bone, am I going to put a six millimeter implant in to increase the bone to implant contact? No, I'm not. I'm going to put a four or a 4.5. That's that's pretty much the maximum that I would go to. I wouldn't go larger than that at all. Um, again, it, it comes down to connection as well because micro motion has a huge impact on, on diameter. In other words, if you're using an external hex, if you're using an internal hex, anything that is dependent on your screw to hold the parts together, then you want to go wider because your micro motion is going to get less and less and less. So, um, it, it's, it's implant dependent, it's it, connection dependent, um, it's uh, tooth position dependent, and, uh, and uh, I suppose quality of bone and whether you are doing an immediate implant that requires primary stability. So sometimes in a molar, you can't use a 3.5. You know what I'm saying? You, sure. have to use, you have to use something wider. Although 
for many, many years, I used, I did a, I did a, a lot of work in the early days when I was, uh, when I was uh, um, using uh, Freelit. I was using the Ankylos system. And I did a lot of uh, A's, to a 3.5 millimeter implants with immediate molars. And it really, really worked well. And still, I have many of the cases come back today. And they just as brilliant as they were then. You know what I mean? So a 3.5 can work in a molar if you have a full Morse taper, proper Morse taper. Um, the nice thing about doing immediate molars with uh, narrow diameter implants is that more often than not, you can you have much more space around the implant. You've got much better chance of bone fill. And you can also use that implant. Um, you know, a lot of times you get great stability just within the furcation bone. Whereas the other stuff, you you know, the minute you go wider and larger, you tend to drill bigger holes and then you start going very, very close to the buckle plate, which you want to stay away from. You want to stay far from the buckle plate as possible. So I still have that and it's, it's possible to do, but we, we generally go for about a four. Four in the molar area is pretty much our standard. And, and I'd say between a 3.5 and a four is the only implants I really use. And on the odd occasion of 4.5 and really I can count them on my hands, I place a five, 5.5. Yeah, it's funny uh, you bring up using a narrower implant because I think even to this day, we still have clinicians who are advocating for placing six, seven, eight, nine millimeter implant diameters in posterior zones. And I'll be honest, uh, I've actually placed some of these very wide diameter implants. Actually one I've placed on my brother uh, in an upper molar in an immediate site. And to be yeah. honest, it has functioned well over the last five yeah. to six years, but is there bone on that buckle aspect? We don't know. And I'm not about to take a CT scan to yeah. find out because we know as, as we get wider and wider, we're having less bone in the long term. So if I had to redo the case, certainly I would not go wider than five millimeter. And, and most of the time, four to five millimeter with the right connection makes a big difference. I totally agree. Totally agree. That gets your brother-in-law. This was on my brother, actually. <laughs> uh, it's even safer, safer, safer than your brother. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to touch base on the next point. And again, this is something I used to use more so in my practice, not so much anymore, which is the use of xenografts. Are we beyond its use in everyday socket preservation? And where does the role of xenografts fit in your practice? Well, I would, I would be arrogant to, to make a prediction and say that it's, uh, that it's dead and it's not. Um, is, it, is it in my hands? Have I moved away from it? I think uh, Rodrigo Neva and Salah Huwais really opened my eyes to allograft. And, uh, you know, we had allograft in the early days and we moved away from that in the, in the you know, um, coming out of the 90s, going into the 2000s when, uh, when, there was, when Geistich became so powerful and, uh, you know, we started using bios and bio guide almost exclusively. Um, I had too many failures and I have to be honest, I, I have, obviously I've been in practice now um, as a specialist since 1998. That makes it, and I've been placing implants since 1994. So that's 25, around 25 years of, of, of implant experience. Um, private practice since 1998, I follow my cases up as often as I can. Um, and I have to tell you, I've had, I've had a number of cases of xenograft um, where I did either immediate placement, whether I did uh, dual zone therapy or I did sinus lifts where I used just xenograft or I did uh, uh, some kind of contour augmentation. And suddenly after 10, 12, 13, 14 years, a fistula pops up. Mm -hmm. And I open up the cases and it's as, I could kind of scratch it out and put it back in the bottle. You know what I mean? And nothing's, nothing's happened to it. And radiographically, you look at the case and it's like, oh wow, this whole thing's fantastic. And also when I do a lot of, because uh, I do sausage technique as well, you know, as part of my armamentarium, I do uh, contour augmentations as well. Um, but the thing is, is that when I open up those cases, when I do get good bone, because that's the problem for me with that stuff. And we had that discussion last week is, is, is kind of having to get down on one knee and pray 
to, to see what you're going to get. Um, but when you open it up and it is hard, it doesn't always look like bone. It, it looks like the granules are still there. And that was always a frustration. And I have to say, uh, Rodrigo's cases really uh, made me stand up and, and look at it carefully. And then uh, Sala was, was absolutely like, change from Zen, change from Zen, I use, uh, use Allograft. And, and I've been kind of using that. And um, I don't have enough data yet myself to make a comment, but certainly moving away from from Zeno and, and, and I'm, I'm looking more towards stuff that is really far more resorbable than non-resorbable. So I'm looking for, I'm looking for things that are going to be replaced in completion. I don't want, I don't want 10, 15 years later to have uh, the same kind of bone that I had on, on the day one that I placed it. I want to have something that's going to really convert. Um, obviously it's why I use autogenous bone a lot. With regards to socket grafting, I'm not a big socket grafter. I don't. I don't. I think I don't believe in charging the patient twice for a bone graft. You know what I'm saying? I think I think if you're going to charge them, let the socket heal. Come back two months later oh. and do your grafting once and once and for all. I see too many cases where people are charging patients for bone membrane a surgery and extraction. Then they come in, they do the implant, and they then have to do another bone graft at that phase. Well, what? Why? I think that's unfair to our patients. Um, but that's just my, it's just an opinion. You know what I mean? I know, I know that yeah, most guys in the States and things like that, they're very much into socket grafting. I understand the concept that socket grafting, you reduce the, 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 the resorption to some degree, but I've too many times also opened up socket grafts that I've done and curated out three quarters, if not all of the stuff that I put in because it's soft rubbish. Right. Um, I, I think a lot of people drill into that and pretend that that's going to form bone later and then get osteointegration around the apex and the palatal portion, but that bone that they have remains, remains rubbish. So um, from that point of view, I've definitely moved away from Allo, from Zeno to Allo. Is it, is, it, is it the death of Zeno? Absolutely not. I think it uh, still forms the basis. And, uh, you know, I, th I think the powers that be and, and, and the, real, the real grandfathers and doyens of dentistry, you know, um, are still pushing it very, very hard. And I think it forms the, the base, the basis of all they do. So I don't think it's dead. No, but I, am I moving away from it? Absolutely. Yeah. This reminds me actually of the great debate that you guys had a number of years ago in Florida and, you know, the results that were shown on the CBCT and although volumetrically it looks fantastic, we have no idea if that's just a hunk of uh, xenograft or actual bone. And for all we know, it's probably uh, not actual bone in front of those implants, but it's still serving a purpose. But I agree, at least for myself, I've kind of stayed away from xenografts. Another factor is the costs that come with these, the use of these biomaterials, um, especially if it's not needed. I found to sticking to allografts mostly in, and assuring that it's not going to have issues down the road, like you mentioned. I'm going to I'm going to actually share a screen with you. I'm going to share. Uh, this is a lecture that I gave to uh, to uh, to you, Penn, the other day. And I, I want to. I'm just going to share with you the CBCTs of um, of it. So let me just let me just quickly share the screen here with you because this is this is really interesting. I'm just going to share the the CBCT. Nothing more. Um, of a case that I did. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, here, here you can see, you can kind of see, and I think this is what we're talking about. You know what I mean? It, it's like you look at the you look at the volume and you look at what it looks like, and it looks great. Right. I mean, and I think everybody that looks at that looks at that as a success. Now. You look at that, and I'm going to show you now an autogenous, the difference between autog an autogenous CBCT. Okay, sorry, and here you can see as well, this is, this is a lot of times, this is a lot of times what my cases look like. Mm -hmm. you know I, mean? I mean, it's just, it's just, it's not as, it's not as pretty. And if you look at, if you look at that, if you look at the, uh, you know, if you look at what it looks like clinically when you take this stuff out, and you know when we when we look at when we look at let's just take I just want to find another one here. 
Yeah, this is this is here's an autogenous block. This is a curry. This is a curry plate. And if you have a look at the CBC difference, and I think this is the key for me. You know what I mean? This is now. I think this is about seven or eight years later, post op. And if you look at the beautiful cortex that's created on the outside with autogenous, etc., and I think um, allograft would probably give you something similar to that um, because a lot of it, a lot of it gets replaced. So you know, from so from that point, so that from that point of view, that's really, you know, when you really go back and you look at your cases and look at them critically, not just look at them patting yourself on the shoulder, but looking yourself and saying, hey, what can I do to improve here? I think you'd be very surprised at what you get. Right. So let's jump into another debate topic in the past section. And I've kind of altered between these two techniques at times, mostly the debate being cement or screw retention and to splint or not splint implants. And I think uh, most of the time, I still prefer to go with screw retention, but as the number of implant units increases to ensure that I have true uh, passive prosthesis, I'll sometimes incorporate custom abutments or try to get some kind of uh, uh, leeway in terms of uh, ensuring that my prosthesis is passive. So what's your thought on cement versus screw and to splint or not to splint? Um, I think, okay, uh, cement versus screw, I, I don't think there's a debate. I think it's crazy to try and use cement. I think the, the effect of cement, I think this, the scientific data, yet, you know, when I speak to David Farinato, who's from Italy, he says that's all we do in Italy is we cement. We don't use screw retain, you know what I mean? Because it's much nicer, it's much more aesthetic. But, you know, for me, there's no doubt, you know, cement causes damage if you get it below the gum, whether it's water-soluble or non-water-soluble. I, I don't know how many times I've opened up my cases where where people have cemented and, and the cement is below and there's the peri-cementitis and, and, and it's just destroyed everything that I've done, you know, all the hard work that I've done. And I think maybe it, it always differs when you're a surgeon stroke prosthodontist versus a prosthodontist stroke you know what I mean? Well, what do you what do you have to deal with? You know what I mean? Um, that being said, you know people often say yes, but I know how to cement, and therefore I will never have that problem. And the problem is not when you have when you know how to cement. The problem is when the crown comes off and you're not at work, and it, it gets cemented by the guy or the lady down the road, and they they just fill it the same way they fill a natural crown and force the thing under the gum, and you know what I mean? Uh, and suddenly three months later, boom, there's a there's a fistula. Right. So. You know, and also obviously retrievability. Why would you? Why would you not want to be able to retrieve the crown? It makes no sense to me to do it that way. There's no doubt it is far more difficult to do a screw retain than it is cement retain. But you know, there's that's what multi-unit abutments are for. Do you know what I'm saying? Most of the systems are coming up with better systems. If you look at the uh, the MIS, the um, um, uh, Nobels, they've all got really cool abutments. I mean, Megagen, all, all of them have these abutments. Uh, Southern Implants has got uh, special types of passive fit abutments. So they've got the coaxis implants and things like that, you know what I mean, which angles the implant to allow for better screw retention. Um, you know, so there are lots of options for you. Um, and, and it's really just about understanding the system that you work with and knowing what to do with it to get it. Splinting versus non-splinting is a different story. You know, does one, one splints, I, I would say your occlusal scheme and your parafunctional habit is a more determining factor around splinting versus non-splinting. What size implants are you using? You know what I mean? If you're using very short implants, then splinting is essential. If you're working in grafted bone in the maxilla, in my cases, I ask always to splint. You know, do I place a, do I place a single crown as a, a single implant in, a, in the six? Very seldom are. I will more often than not place two implants and splint them in the upper jaw because the bone quality there is just not, not as good. And especially if I'm having to do sinus grafting, you know what I mean? There, the quality goes yeah. down even further. So that, that would be my basis for, for splinting or not splinting. But I mean, obviously, um, interestingly enough, there's, uh, there's prosthodontists in South Africa who say they never put implants next to each other and and put uh, individual crowns because working the contact is way too difficult. And when I challenge them on that, they tell me that I should stick to periodontics. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you know, but, but I, I mean, I, 
if, if you gave it to me, if, if I said, what would I want in my mouth and what would you want in your mouth? I'd want individual teeth because a bridge right. to clean is a nightmare. So, I mean, if I could have individual teeth in FP1 style uh, situations, that's, that's pretty much what I'd go for. But I mean, obviously it's not always possible. So let's jump into the present topic. And I think this kind of relates again to the prosthetic portion that we just mentioned, which is the use of angulated screw channels or angulated implants. So I had a chance to play with the Southern coaxis implant a few years ago. I have not personally placed them in practice, but I saw you were involved in uh, either placement or uh, some of the development aspects with that implant. So what's your thought on angulated screw channels or angulated implants? Does that entirely eliminate the need for cement at all? Uh, firstly, I was not involved in the development of those implants okay. at all. It was, it was a guy, Dale House uh, and uh, Andrew Ackerman in South Africa, two really great prosto guys in South Africa. And uh, hats off to them because it was a brilliant design. Um, there's no doubt the whole purpose of that, I mean, the whole purpose of that was to take, was to make uh, the angulation correct without having to use a, an angled abutment. So from a cost point of view, you could take away the angled abutment, but the problem there is that you have to then use an external hex. You can't use a, an internal hex or, a, or the cone connection, which they have. Because the minute you have cone connections, you can't work for multi-units, you can't work at implant level. It's just not possible whether you have an angle, whether you have an angle change or not. You have to bring something above the gum that you where you can work with a with a very short, you know, your, your path of insertion is very, very is very, very right. wide so that you can get your, your thing seated passively. So um, no doubt that if you're doing um, if you are doing um, like all on fours, all on sixes with uh, tilted angles and they've got those things in and you're using an external hex with passive fits, then, then they work extremely, extremely well. Also, when you are doing immediate implants and you have uh, like a class one uh, when your, your, your sagittal root position is from our article is class one, I think from Joseph Kahn's, it's a class two. Um, so we differ in the way we, we put the, the, the implant that's sitting straight out then most often those implants, you cannot, if you're using a straight implant, it's very, very difficult to, to get screw retained. But obviously also we must understand that the biaxial screws have also changed all of that as well. Because biaxial screws have now given us the ability to angulation change for up to 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. So that's also, I think, uh, has been a big game changer for us is the, is the introduction of biaxial screws because it's, it means that the, the, the implant can be changed. But certainly it gives you another option. And I think it's a, it's a great design. And my hat's off to Dale and to Andrew for, and to Southern for that brilliant design because it really gives options. What I was busy with them and what I helped develop uh, was uh, Stephen Chu and Dennis Tarnow's design of the inverter implant, which is kind of obviously the, the body shifting where you've got a very thin top and a very right. fat, a very fat, uh, a very, uh, very fat uh, base um, to give you primary stability in the base. And then the narrowness is exactly what we're talking about earlier about narrowing the top, increasing the jump gap, increasing the space, therefore allowing more bone growth around the top where you have good uh, where you have good uh, good growth so those are those are key factors and i think um i think um all good options uh, in the right situation so let's jump to implant connections so for myself i'm at 10 years of implant dentistry experience so we were trained initially with nobel replace and then we jumped to a number of different systems Right now, more towards a conical connection in my practice. I've used both internal hex and conical connections. If you had to pick between the two connections, which one would you choose and why? And where would you use one versus another? I think, I think we have to just discern between a conical connection and a more stable connection. For sure. Because, they, because they're two different things. So a conical connection is, is basically, it's like a Morse taper, but a lot shorter. And they do not form the cold well that the true lock, like a Bicon, Ankylos, Megagen, et cetera, those type of implants create. And then the Southern DC as well, the, the 
the deep conical, like the Astra, okay, which is a copy of the Astra. So those implants physically, the screw does not hold the whole component together. Once you brought the screw down, the cold weld between metal on metal is what gives you the stability. And if you ask me what would I want in my mouth, it would be a deep conical, it would be a more stable connection, not a conical, because the conical is the same as the internal. Now, they certainly better because they, they give you the platforms, the natural built-in platform switching, so you don't get bone loss around the, around the neck the way the other ones do, but you are still dependent on the screw to hold everything together. And I think that's where the difference is for me, what I would like to do. Now, Grant, now if you spoke to Graham Blackbeard from Southern, he will tell you that uh, um, you know, they, can get, uh, they can get good preload with external hexes as well, and they don't get mm. screw loose as well, et cetera. And, and I believe them. And, and the guys that are doing it, with the, if you look at guys like Costa Nicolopoulos and things, I mean, just beautiful, outstanding work. If you look at his work, it's just it's out of the, it's out of the top drawer. But for me personally, um, you know, the problem always comes, we, we always have to do things and develop things for the worst common denominator, not the best people. Because the best people always do things right and, and do things the best way. But the problem is, is that I would say 80% of the people are not in that population. Uh, you've only got 20% or less even, maybe 5% who do things to that level with that perfection, whereas the rest of them kind of, uh, it's slapdash, not as, not as precise, and it's, you know, the, it's, they're not as finicky as, 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 as the other group are. So we have to just, I would, in those kind of cases, you've got less chance of making a mess, less chance of having problems with, uh, with bacterial leakage, with correct uh, loads and things like that. But, Again, it does bring the problem of when you're having multiple implants of increasing the cost because now you have to use multi-unit abutments because getting your implants dead parallel is almost impossible. And, I mean, not impossible now with guided surgery and uh, navigated surgery, dynamic navigation, but, um, but a lot more difficult. And, you know, it just has to be a few degrees out and, and you can't get it down and that's frustrating as hell. Yeah, I, I think I'm of the same mindset on the use of a uh, true deep conical connection, which is, I mean, they are still using a screw for retention, but even if that screw is tightened to 10 or 15 uh, Newton centimeter, you're not relying on the screw for resistance, yeah. uh, you know, against the, you know, your occlusal load, which yeah. leads to my next question. With these kinds of implant systems, a lot of them advocate for subcrestal placement. Can we do the same kind of uh, decision making with an internal hex implant? I see a lot of doctors sometimes get um, questions asked about, you know, uh, should I place an internal hex crestal, subcrestal? Should I place this kind of uh, implant system, crestal or subcrestal? I think the only implant you don't place subcrestal these days is a uh, is a, uh, a tissue level implant. I think most people. Um, as long as you can platform switch your implant, um, I would place the implant um, at least a millimeter subcrestal. Yeah. Um, subcrestal placement has huge benefits, you know, to the to the implant. Is that if you look, uh, remember Scott Gans always talks about his triangle of his. Tri I can't remember what the the correct term is. Now, I apologize if you're listening, Scott, but it's triangle, triangle of, of bone. Triangle of bone. Thank you. Um, and essentially. If you look at the triangle, the triangle is, it, when you put it at bone level, your triangle's at its narrowest. Mm -hmm. And we know, and there's a very interesting uh, study that came out, a, a new animal study that came out from uh, Monier, from uh, Vivian Chapui and Danny Booz's group, an animal study where they actually measured uh, a really cool uh, a study which confirmed the amount of bone that we require around an implant. It was a 2019 publication. And, um, it showed that we require 1.5. And the minute you go a little bit deeper, you're getting thicker bone. You're getting more soft tissue on top. We look at Thomas Linkovicius's work. I mean, I think Thomas at the beginning was very much a crystal bone level, crystal bone, you know, to place them at the crest. And I think he's, he's now also changed to sub crystal placement mm -hmm. because even if you get a little bit of bone loss around the top, your soft tissue is thicker. 
and with thicker soft tissue uh, from his work, we, we get more stable uh, um, um, bone around. So I, I, I'm very much a deeper placer. And the more you place, the more you place shallow, the more you end up with problems. And um, even even external hexes place them a little bit deeper. You know, what I mean, it, it mm -hmm. just gives you the thickness of bone around the implant that's going to give you a much more stable soft tissue over time. Yeah, I think that's very important in terms of accounting for future bone loss or changes, especially in the first year or even past that. Is is getting that implant deeper? If if you end up having it too shallow, you cannot repair that afterwards. You'd have to mm -hmm. resort to leaving it or, um, you know, resort to maybe uh, soft tissue grafting techniques to compensate Absolutely. for it. I do find though with some companies, the prosthetics that are released in terms of healing abutment design and the shapes of the prosthetics, even for uh, your impression coping and uh, even scan yeah. bodies, do not correspond to what we're trying to achieve. And you end up actually having to go and remove or profile yeah. the bone with some implant systems in order to accommodate for that placement of depth. So there's a disconnect between um, the, the manufacturer and what we're trying to achieve. I agree. I think a lot of the cases where they have that, you know, it's almost like an immediate square. That just, uh, that makes no sense to me. It makes absolutely no sense why you're trying to do that because that's stuck in the old dogma of having your abut having your your implant the same width as your your, your sorry your abutment the same width as your implant and having your uh, your crown emerge from your implant at the at the same thickness and that's just crazy because we're not doing that we're narrowing everything we you know I me mean? we need to we need to create that mushroom shape that that uh, that gives us the the the, the tissue thickness and and the, and the stability. So I agree with you. I think I think there is a disconnect, and I think the I think uh, the, the prosto guys um, sometimes miss the boat on that on, in that department. And they need to kind of we need to we need to almost have a meeting and say, hey, this is what we need. But by the same token, there are a lot of systems out there that have that understand that situation and they think so. If that's the case and you use a system, don't, then maybe it's time to change to a system that gives you the, the subcrestal option and you don't have to take a, a trefine or, or, a, or a bone profiler to, to drill yeah. away the bone because that's just the, I mean, why? Yeah. Why would you want to profile the bone? It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done it in a number of years now, but to me, it seems crazy to, to ship these knowing that if, <laughs> if you create the bone, you have to go and ditch the bone in order exactly. to fit the prosthetics when there is room for improvement in the prosthetics without having to do that. So yeah, no, do. we'll jump to uh, the last topic in the present day section, which is partial extraction therapy. And for myself, I got introduced to the concept again through dental XP and seeing some of the discussions online and kind of asking you and, and different mentors of mine along the way to develop this technique into my private practice. So I'm at five years of use in private practice. Do I think it's technique sensitive? Yes, and I don't advocate it for beginner doctors who can't do an atraumatic extraction to jump into something like this. And although there is debates on the merits of its use on both sides, some people saying this is rubbish, some people saying my results are fantastic, I think it's here to stay. So is this a new standard of care that every doctor should be looking at? Or what's your thought on the last, I would say, over 10 years uh, for yourself in private practice? I think, I think the interesting part is that you include this in the present and not in the future. That's already a good sign. And I think that already says something about what PET has done. Um, and it's interesting because I see I've got a, I've got a notification from ResearchGate today to say that, uh, to say that uh, um, uh, Benich and Christoph Hamley's book, they cited our pet, our pet articles in uh, Maurice, my, Maurice and myself's pet articles in their book, uh, which was nice to see from, a, from somebody who I think is one of the, the highest level of researchers in the world, Christoph Hamley and Benich as well, also done some amazing work. So it's a real, it's, I think that's a telling factor for me, you know, when, when people of that standard start to uh, stand up and take note. 
Um, there's no doubt in my mind what you say is is, is absolutely right. Uh, you need to do it with training. You can't do this without training, and it's, it's stupid to and not fair to your patients. Um, there's no doubt that our techniques are getting better, and we've just published a new article in International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry, which hopefully will come out soon. It was supposed to come out in Feb, and um, obviously the COVID virus has delayed the publication, so hopefully it'll come out in the next one. And this really, what we've tried to do here is really try and improve the, the, the ease of the technique so that people can do it with a lot uh, with a, with a lot, people with a lot less finesse can also get the same kind of result. Mm -hmm. Is it here to stay? It's certainly in my hands. You know, I, I really, it doesn't bother me if people say no. If they get the same results and they think they do and they're happy, great. You know what I mean? Keep using what you're using. I don't. I, I've tried most techniques out there and I've failed more times than I've succeeded. When I look at my cases over the years, and I think that's the key, you know, that, you know what I mean? When, when, I, when you've got, 25 years under your belt and you can look back at your cases and you can say whoa you know what i mean it started out great it's gone from top draw to bottom draw and it usually happens around year seven to ten that's when they start to suddenly collapse you know what i mean things mm -hmm. are great and i'm going into uh, eight years of uh, of uh, actually more because if i look at uh, um, root submergence, Maurice's, Maurice's uh, technique uh, from uh, root submergence. When I first read that article, I did a case and, uh, of root submergence way back in 2008. So I've been doing root submergence even longer and socket shield since 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. So I have just never experienced anything better. And, 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 and I know you and I have discussed it. And I know when you look at your cases and, and I look at my cases and I I see the cases that that the average the average guys are doing, and they're just getting phenomenal cases. It's not like a it's not like a one off, you know. You're getting nine out of ten beautiful, stunning, gingival architecture with a pink aesthetic score. Sometimes ten out of ten, right? Uh, or if not ten out of ten, it's nine out of ten. There's no scarring. It's a single procedure. It's it costs the patient less. There's less surgery. It just it makes no sense to me to go and do any other technique which is going to put the patient through multiple surgeries, multiple costs. Um, who's benefiting here? And uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'll just throw it in there. <laughs> <laughs> but who does benefit if, 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 if we go the other route? You know what I mean? And it's companies. Companies benefit. And unfortunately, mm. with this technique, no company benefits. And the uh, and uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 always it's always a problem when no company benefits because there's no one to push it. But it's grown organically, and why is it grown organically? Because it works. Right. If it didn't, if it didn't work, there is this thing would be dead in the water five years ago. Yeah. If people, if people, if people without your skill set or my skill set couldn't do it, okay, it would die because you have individual people pushing a technique and there are so many techniques out there that that have died a natural death because you know it was not reproducible it wasn't repeatable by other people but this is a technique that's repeatable and whenever i go around the world it's very seldom that i have people say i've done 10 and 10 out of 10 i've got they just failed miserably they were terrible you know i've got most people go home, they try the technique, even with a little bit of differences or nuances in how they've done it or not perfect, they're still getting really great results. And I say, well, how many have you done? Now I've done about five. Mm -hmm. And how's it gone? All five look amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what you want. You want to walk away with the technique and say, hey, this is a reproducible technique. I mean, I've said this to you and we've spoken about this many times, reproducible predictability, two key words in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. reproduce the, the, the results you're getting, number one? And can people who are taking that technique get the same results as you? That's number two. If you have those two things, you have a technique that is successful. And that, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion because the, there's still many naysayers who, who are waiting for long-term data and, and we'll, we'll bring the, the long-term data. It's on its way. But it takes time to develop long-term data. And um, um, hopefully by the time you get the long-term data, you'll, you'll, you'll actually be okay to say, hey, I was wrong yeah. and this looks good. 
But I think I, mean, it's my... I, I have no doubt in my mind. I, I've just never achieved the success and the predictability like I'm achieving now. It's just, it's staggering. I, I love, I can't wait to get another case because the results are just that good every single day. Yeah. I mean, prior to COVID, I had uh, done a full arch case using PET and FP1. And I was just sending uh, some of the pictures to Ehab the other day. And I was showing him the volume, especially around the canine region. And I, I don't think if I did a full extraction on a canine site, I could ever reproduce the kind of volume that we had. And mind you, I mean, you do get sometimes small complications. I wouldn't say these are failures. You get shield exposures that need to be trimmed or adjusted. And as long as people are comfortable knowing that these things are manageable, it shouldn't scare them away from the technique. 100%, 100%. And I think, Mark, what, what, what you are saying here as well, you know, what, what you're explaining and what you're getting is exactly what everybody else is getting. And that's why it's growing organically because it is because everybody else that picks it up has the same, has the same experience. So I think, yes, I think it's here to stay. I think in 20 years time, we, it will, it, it will be the standard of well, not 20 years time. I would say probably in about, in about another uh, nine years when we, when we're able to publish our 10 year prospective, because we'll be, we're ready for our one year prospective. The data is ready. And uh, the results are, are brilliant uh, with the newer technique, with the newer bone level technique, with the prosthetic shaping, etc. We've got 100% success. We had one complication out of 15, hmm. um, which was managed and fixed within a month. Um, internal exposure, and that was, again, just my stupidity. Um, you know, I, I didn't do the, my job properly on the day, wasn't thinking properly, etc. Over contoured my 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 uh, customer abutment, and as a result of that, I had an exposure. Dealt with it, 100%, everything's perfect. Yeah, I think this uh, also leads to an interesting discussion because people say, is there bone in front of the shield, uh, or sorry, between the implant and the shield? Um, is it uh, some kind of tissue uh, in between bone? Is it true bone? But then when I think back to, again, to the use of xenografts, we place xenograft in front of the implant and do we have integration there or not and does it even matter so if i think about in terms of the aesthetic outcome of what we're trying to achieve if i have integration the histology confirms that you can get bone there's no doubt about it um the prospective study will show that you need to put bone there okay because we've got two cases where we didn't get bone formation we still have phenomenal success, but we randomized, we randomized uh, bone versus no bone. So we, we kind of, every second one got bone, we just chose. It wasn't like a, a we didn't like make a decision. We just said, right, you get bone, you don't get bone. You get bone, you get bone. We just nip one, slip one. And two out of the eight cases that didn't get bone um, looks like there's soft tissue ingrowth mm. on the buckle. Um, so you are placing still- bone now. Well, well yeah. we, we, we're continuing with the knit one, slip one. Got um, it. But six out of eight, you know, until we have, we want to develop 20 cases at least. Um, so um, at the moment, we're at 16 cases and, and 15 of them have got to a year already. So we can already look at that data and start to measure. So um, mm-hmm. my advice is at this point from that, that yes, I would want to put something in there. And w- what would I put there? I would put there, I would probably put an allograft uh, some form of allograft um, um, would be would be ideal in that area. Zeno, I wouldn't use Zeno because nothing happens to that bone. I, I don't believe it turns over uh, enough, right. and I don't, I don't want to be stuck with uh, with something that's dead or, or 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 not not able to to be resorbed by the body. So definitely, my advice at this point from our prospective unpublished prospective uh, data at this point is that we need to fill the jump gap. But what do the rest of them show? They show bone. I mean, Chuck Schwimmer's got a got a case yeah. where he yeah, I don't, you've seen that case. I yeah. think there's a it's about five millimeters between the bone and the implant, and you just see. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing else that could be in there but bone. It is mm-hmm. so beautifully uh, healed. It is just amazing what that CBCT looks like. So, you know, there's lots of there's lots of data coming, and it, it'll 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 continue to push. And I think. 
The other key factor about Soccer Shield and PET is this, is that it's all very well to have prospective studies and things like that. And I, I said this, uh, I can't remember, I think it was, I think it was, I, was, uh, I had a discussion with Sanjay and uh, and uh, and Lanka Makesh. We spoke about this the other night on uh, on uh, 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 Sunday, and um, there's a publication which shows that 90% of all cancer research is not reproducible. Okay, so someone's bullshitting, someone's lying, and that's crazy. 90%, and I think there's a lot of that in dentistry as well, where there's a lot of stuff that's published that really has no this. You know, pu publishing, you know, you can pay to have it published. And I think there's a lot of politics in publications as well these days, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yes. You know who you know, not what you know. And um, a lot of stuff gets published and a lot of stuff isn't reproduced. And, you know, one person has done a case series and you base an entire, you base an entire uh, industry on that one publication. And that's happening. Um, that's happening today. The thing about Soccer Shield and PET is that it's there's tons of different groups around the world who are jumping in and doing research. And you know what? They're all coming up with the same results. And I think that's the key where, you know what I mean, where it's, it's totally different to some of the other techniques. And I think that's where it's great. That's, where, that's why it will survive. You know, it's not, you haven't got half the groups coming back with poor results and half the group coming back with great results. You know what I mean? I think there's one group in India who, who, who wrote a systematic review, which was not a systematic review of, at all, because a systematic yeah. review, uh, the guidelines for it mean you have to take um, um, articles that are all the same kind of technique. And they took four or five different techniques, clumped them all together and said, oh, soccer shield doesn't work. We yeah. should be careful about it and not do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's the only negative that's come out and that they're not, they, they're not even doing it. Yeah, and I think we have to be careful. I mean, what we consider a complication versus a failure because, I mean, is a complication that's dealt with and managed yet continuing with success for many years later better than having something that looks fantastic at year one and five. And then when you have an issue with a tooth next door to it, which was holding up, uh, you know, the bundle bone in place, and then you end up with complications to, uh, due to that uh, as well right absolutely absolutely i think you know i would my cases long term they just they look amazing the soft tissue is amazing everything stays the same and it's just we we and and we've with with the new prospective study and with obviously with the change of technique that we had post our 128 case study you know when we posted that case, that that study in um uh, um, of 128 cases and what we learned from that was invaluable in teaching us and we've virtually eliminated those complications by going bone level by creating prosthetic space by um, shaping your uh, your custom abutment or, or crown correctly we've eliminated those complications and as you say those complications are, are not they not it's not like an exposed membrane where it has potential to destroy exactly. your entire your entire graft and you have to start again you, mm -hmm. you you manage it in a very simple way, and we'll you know we'll come up with new publications soon on 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 management of internal shield exposures and things like that. And, but it's really neither here nor there. So we'll jump into our last section, which is the future of implant dentistry. And I've put first an interesting category in here, which is denting grafting. So we'll actually lump this together with our last focus on PET. So I've done it myself where I've taken a portion of the tooth in doing a PET procedure and then re-implemented it into grafting that zone. And I think the role of denting grafting, which is an interesting concept, plays a, an important role in looking at alternatives to things like xenografts and their use. So what's your thought on denting grafting? Well, I have to I have to apologize to uh, to uh, Professor Binderman because in the beginning I was very skeptical, skeptical and quite vocal. And I'm and I'm, um, you know, if I if I ever put my foot in my mouth, and I'm I'm happy to apologize for that. And I think I have to apologize for that because, but the reason the reason why I changed my mind really was this Anna Paul, and the work that she's done on her on her on her M Ivan technique, uh, which I'm sure you've seen on on Dental XP. Um, and she's getting, I have to, I have to say there, 
their people I trust and their people I don't. There's Anna is one of those people that I trust. You know, she there, there's no bullshit with her, and what you see is what you get. And when she shows me cases, I know that what I can see is 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 things. So um, I've been using it more and more. Um, there's no doubt in my mind it really it lengthens my 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 work time. Um, that that it does because I have to wait for my PRF. You know, if I want to make sticky sticky uh, sticky dentine or sticky bone yeah. dentine, whatever you want to call it. You have to wait to to you know until you've extracted the tooth and then cleaned the tooth and prepared the tooth. And exactly. while you're doing that, you know what I mean. So it just it takes a little bit more time. But um, you know the lucky thing is is that um, I've done a lot. Funny enough, I've done quite a few cases in the last two weeks because obviously we have much more time on our hands because we've we've cut our patient load down to half. So we're taking much more time and and uh, which has given me the opportunity to to use it. So. Um, is it showing good promise? Yes, it looks it looks very very interesting. I think if you look at Dong Sok Song's work, Professor Song's work as well, where he's cutting up teeth and using them as bone blocks as well, interesting stuff. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's creative and it's interesting. And um, it's definitely progressive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, how it develops from my side. Um, but certainly I am, uh, I'm, I'm back on board, not back on board. I'm on board with it. And I'm certainly looking at it as a, as a real option. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, um, with socket shield and partial extraction therapy, there's not many teeth that you have that you're able to do that with. Do you know what I'm saying? Because. Yeah. It's I mean, yeah. I mean, it depends on how much of the tooth is left, the kind of condition. Yeah, uh, exactly. Non, no, uh, non-endo, et non-endo, et cetera. But certainly, uh, like you mentioned, if you have the time on your hand and you're willing to go through the, the process of getting the dentin prepared, it certainly, it does create a lot of volume, I found as well, in terms of what you can get out of a, out of a single tooth. Yeah, that's yeah. unbelievable, unbelievable. And certainly, uh, Shnezana has, uh, has uh, published some new data on the Glocker technique, whereby either tuberosity or, or dentine was the only stuff that worked well and you've got fantastic hard solid bone in the in the glocker in the glocker technique, which is uh, one of the partial extraction therapy techniques. So that was also interesting for me, and uh, somewhere where I, I would use it. And I think uh, these days, you know, extracting molars and grinding up is yeah, it's a way to go. So we'll jump into our last question in the future section, which is: Are we at a peak in the development of implant design? Um, I think we've kind of looked at very uh, similar designs in terms of what companies are coming out with. So do you think we've hit a plateau in the development and in terms of going back to other designs uh, of a hybrid implant design, are we uh, trending back towards that now? Or what's your thought on implant design? I think if you're going back to hybrid implant designs, then you don't trust your bone graft techniques as far as I'm concerned, then you should change your bone grafting technique to one that actually works and maintains the bone. Um, I think, I, I think, um, I don't think we're at a, we're, we're anywhere close to where we're going to go with nano, with nanotechnology. And I think uh, we're going to start, we're going to start seeing, you know, once we start getting to that level um, with putting substances within nanotubules within the, within the, uh, Within the uh, the uh, within the, the the surface itself, um, so I think we'll have that. Um, I think there's there's lots of potential. I think um, uh, with regards to osteodensification, I think there'll be new stuff coming out with osteodensification and and, and implants that are that actually densify the bone rather than rather than cut the bone. And I think uh, uh, Strauman already believed that their BLX is a is a is a osteodensifying uh, implant um, but I think new stuff will come out with osteodensification and stuff like that but I certainly I don't think that we're at a you know it's new things will new, new new avenues will open up all the time and I think uh, nanotechnology I think is one of the keys um, yeah. and I think that's, that, that's where that's where we'll start getting uh, we'll start getting improvements is is at that level and it's a uh, you know Moore's law we we, we double our we double our uh, we double our technology every every year to two years, and I think we'll start to see more and more stuff coming out. You know, people—that's the wonderful thing about human beings—is they, you know, when when uh, 
when you, just when you think you've hit a, a wall, suddenly, you know, you just smash through that wall and, you know, we find a new, a new glass ceiling and smash that one. So that's the cool Fantastic. thing. I don't think we, I don't think we've seen anything yet. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, I'm at 10 years now. And when I look back at the last year, the two years prior, five years prior, and if I say to myself always, would you have approached the case differently or would you use a technique in a similar fashion? If, and if the answer is yes, I think you're doing maybe a disservice to yourself in terms of educating yourself into what's out there. So I think uh, evolving as a clinician and keeping up to date without, with uh, your education is very important. And yeah. also making sure that, you know, the technique is reproducible, like you mentioned in your hand. Absolutely. Howie, so you have, uh, for people that don't know, Howie's got uh, an institution for training as well in uh, Cape Town, correct? In Plant and Aesthetic Academy. Great. So when things get back to normal, I know a lot of colleagues have made the trip out there. They can come and check out <laughs> Howie's institution, uh, great guy, down to earth, says it as it is. So I've always respected that aspect from you, okay. and it's been a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for thank you for having us, and uh, I'm gonna go to sleep now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's three. It's three o'clock here today, so. Yeah, but I have I have to say I look forward to traveling again, and I look forward to getting back to Canada. I look forward to getting back to the states, and uh, you know the. There's so many great projects that we had on the go. 2020 was really going to be the year we were going to really, there were so many things we we're going to do. So 2021 is really looking good. And uh, uh, I just wish everybody stays safe and, and healthy. And, um, you know, I hope you and your family are, are well wherever you may be. And I look forward to seeing everybody in person again at conferences, because I think uh, as much as it not, as much as the digital is nice, uh, the analog is nicer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. We'll have an analog drink next time. <laughs> All right, okay. well, well, pleasure. Not at all.